Thank you. Let's see. Oh, I got to turn this on. I got more high tech equipment up here than you can shake a stick at. Thank you for coming out tonight for this incredibly interesting topic. And uh, I feel like it's own old home week. I have Professor Roy Finkenbein, my colleague, who will be speaking here. What's your topic in July? About uh, the slavery abolitionist movement from the University of Detroit Mercy. Give him a plug. And uh, oh, yeah, give some, Professor Finkenbein, he will be. So be here July 2nd. And I have people from the Redford Theater where I sometimes introduce the movies. Spotlight, 50 50 raffle. Who has been to the Redford Theater? Okay. I'm on the west side, aren't I? If you haven't been for a while, <clears throat> you need to come. And uh, we, it's just such a fun time. So, my little turn at show business. You know, um, it's ironic that I should be talking to you all. I've already been hearing some stories. I have to make a confession. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Detroit and World War II, this book that I wrote. Um, I'm not from Detroit. I think I've been here almost 25 years. I know I can pass a road map test. I know where Roseville is and Zug Island and Allen Park. I know, I know where places are, but I didn't grow up here. I did not um, try a Sanders hot fudge sundae till I was 32. I never had uh, better made potato chips until I got here. Verners. Verners, uh, I had Verners. We had Verners. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, which is another, I'm a Hoosier. Um, I still don't, I still, I, I tell people, I'm, I, was t I gave a talk on the east side recently, and I said, oh, is that over near Gratiot, Ave Gratiot Avenue? Or Lasher, the Redford Theater's on Lasher. Is that how you say that word? Le Quindre. And uh, my Hoosier brain cannot quite figure out how you all drive south to go to Canada. This just does not compute for me, being from Indianapolis. So, um, but I've fallen in love with Detroit over the years. And uh, how many of you are from other places? You grew up other places than, say, metropolitan Detroit. You can't, when did you come to the planet Detroit? Where are you from? Uh, Flint. Flint. Well, that's a stone's throw. Okay. Anybody grow up not in Michigan, I wonder? Where, where, are, you, where are you refugees from? Where do you? St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis? Are you a Cardinals or a Tigers fan? Both. <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. Whoever's winning. Whoever's winning. Depends on who's playing on the day. Okay. Gil, where, where did you grow up? Central New York. Well, we're glad you came to Michigan. Anybody else from another? Where'd you grow up? Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland. Yeah, same thing. Cleveland, Detroit were sister cities. Is there no one more back there? Okay. Well, yeah, who, who's from somewhere else? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay. You know, it's a disadvantage in a way as a historian or as somebody writing about Detroit in World War II to not be from here. And I didn't grow up with this stuff in my blood. But I also think it's a little bit of an advantage because you all who are from other places can, you're from a different place too, right? We see what is unique about this area of the world, like driving south to Canada. What makes Detroit really a unique place in the world? More, I think I see it more than some of the natives. You all probably take certain things about Detroit for granted. So I bring a little bit of an outsider's view um, so it's ironic that a Hoosier is going to talk to you about Detroit in, during the Second World War, the arsenal of democracy. And it's also ironic because I think we actually have people in the room who remember the Second World War. Am I right about that? Raise your hand if you have memories of the Second World War period. I know you didn't enlist. I know you weren't fighting. Um, but maybe you remember um, v, VJ Day in Detroit, mid-August of 1945. Anybody remember, uh, let's see, um, the day President Roosevelt died, which was April 12th, 1945. People remember hearing that on the radio. And by the way, this is such a, you, you're my people. This is such a great group. It's different than my day job. You came here voluntarily. I can't give you a test or a quiz. Um, you love history. You've lived history. My day job is standing in front of 20-year-olds trying to get them interested in the Marshall Plan 
or the WPA or these remote, they, even the 1990s are very remote for young people. So um, does anybody have a memory, you're going to date yourself now, but does anybody remember Pearl Harbor Day? Okay, all right, yeah, that was the slowest I've ever seen you move, uh, Gil. Uh, just, you know, and sadly, I also have to say, some of our younger students, they don't know what December 7th, 1941 means. Some of them, sadly, they're very bright. They can run circles around me in technology, but some of them don't, can't answer the question, who were we fighting in the Second World War? So I'm preaching to you guys, the choir, different than my night job, and we got a problem. We got a real problem in the country. We need to get these young people interested in history, knowing what their grandparents, what their great-grandparents were doing. And certainly, I think a good, good starting point is Detroit during this very exciting, impactful period of the Second World War when we truly were the arsenal of democracy. Um, and I, I, so I, I got a call about, uh, well, from you sent me the email. I got a call from this group, this publisher called the History Press. Maybe you've seen their local histories. Are there still a Barnes and Noble anywhere, or bookstores? Um, I got a call, I talked to the guy, and he said, you know, we have a book on Baltimore and World War II. We have a book on Pittsburgh and World War II. Uh, Professor Sumner, would you like to write a book on Detroit? And, and before he finished the sentence, I said, I'll take it, because it's such a great, great topic. And so for about a year, I was driving people crazy, asking them about World War II talking about the number of tanks produced at the Warren Tank Arsenal, talking about the 8,668 B-24 bombers built at Willow Run. People were going crazy. Um, but I loved writing this book, and it turned out to be kind of a tribute to the people who won that war, particularly Detroiters. And I had surprises as I wrote the book. Everybody knows this phrase. Even my students know phrases like arsenal of democracy. My students also, particularly my female students, 20, 19, 18, they know something about we can do it. You know, Rosie the Riveter. And I've heard people out in the crowd, if you have memories of the war, I'll say a few things about writing this book. I'll go through my slideshow of images from the book. And then I'd like to turn it over and hear from people who actually have memories or know somebody who was a Rosie the Riveter or was living in Detroit. I tried to write a book not just about the military side of the war, soldiers, uh, Selfridge Field, um, you know, what was it like to have civil defense drills and to kind of be on guard. There was a great concern that obviously Detroit would have been a top target had the Nazis, for instance, been able, or, the, or the Japanese been able to reach us with their long range bombs. Turns out they weren't able to do that, but we were on edge, particularly after uh, after the attack at Pearl Harbor, which just shocked us so much. Um, so I wanted to also, I didn't just want to write the, about the military side, and I also didn't just want to write about production. You know, Willow Run, the Packard plant building Merlin Rolls-Royce engines for various fighter craft. Uh, of course, uh, Highland Park, virtually every industrial enterprise in this city, and I, I, when I say city, I mean the metro area, was involved in war production and transformed almost overnight to making the weaponry of war, without which we could not have won that war. I wanted to write about production, but I also wanted to write about what was it like to grow up in Detroit, to be a kid during the Second World War. And I've heard people say, you know, it was scary. I worried about my dad or my grandfather in the war, my uncle, my brother. But I also hear a lot of people say, you know, it was kind of fun to grow up in Detroit in the 1940s. We got to stay out in the summertime till the lights came on. Uh, we rode our bikes all over the city. People didn't lock their doors. Maybe there was a greater sense of neighborliness in those days. Kids were doing scrap drives at school. They could win tickets to a Tigers game. They were following the war on maps. They would listen, and again, my students can't understand. You listened, you watched, you listened to radio and saw newsreels. It's so foreign to somebody who grew up, you know, who was born in 2000, when, when our college freshmen were born. What was sports like in Detroit during the Second World War? Um, what were the nightclubs like? What was it like having so many people, white and black and different ethnicities, pouring into the city? 
And, uh, you know, if I could use a phrase from that time, the joint was jumping in Detroit. It was jam-packed with people, a lot of them new, newly to the city. There was a lot going on. Um, and uh, it was an exciting place, but it was also a deadly serious business. You know, a lot of people tend to forget there was opposition to us going to World War II. A lot of it, even in Detroit uh, and throughout the country. I think on the eve of, I, I, probably on December 6, 1941, if you took a survey of the American people, I'm sure a large majority would say no more war. You know, Hitler controls Europe, he's threatening Moscow, he's got North Africa, the Japanese are um, devastating the Asian er arena. Um, stay out of war. And I understand why people were against going to yet another war. Um, we just had one 20 years earlier, World War I, the Great War. We lost a lot of young men, a lot of damage, it cost a lot of money, and I'm not sure people really thought, was it really worth it to go fight in Europe? To, you know, for what? So it's, people don't realize a number of things. There was a lot of opposition to the war. Pearl Harbor, when, it was, uh, when the news reports first came across the radio on that Sunday, probably late afternoon, early evening here in Detroit, um, people were shocked. They were frightened. I tell my students, they don't even remember 9-11 now. You know, I, I used to be able to say, well, 9-11, remember how shocked you all were on that day? It came out of the blue, seemingly. Um, and I'm not sure how closely people were following world events. The other thing about World War II, I speak from the American side, we could have lost that war. We could have lost that war. We were close on a number of fronts of seeing the Nazis or even the Japanese irrevocably sealing their position as dominant powers. Um, it took a Herculean, I would say, heroic effort, almost overnight, to turn the, the power of this country toward winning the war and having every man, woman, and child at home on the home front, as well as people enlisting for the military being drafted. It took everybody to pull together, and we were able to turn that thing around, but it took years. And when you think about it, it's, it's sobering to think about what if the United States had not joined the war. Uh, England would have been toast. Gosh knows what would have happened. Um, we'd have been in big trouble. Um, and you know, not everybody thought, when Pearl Harbor happened, by the way, you know Admiral Yamamoto, who planned the Pearl Harbor attack that terrible morning, 2,403 Americans killed on that day in Hawaii. Uh, by the way, a lot of people didn't know what Pearl Harbor was when they heard it on the radio. What's Pearl Harbor? Is it, a, is it a ship? Is it a plane? Is it a country? What is it? We quickly realized that it means war. It means the Japanese have attacked our base and caused many deaths and, and in injuries. Admiral Yamamoto, people forget about this, he had studied in the United States. He was ordered by the, uh, the military dictatorship in Japan, do this attack on Pearl Harbor. And he basically told them, I'll do the attack. And I think he planned it brilliantly. We were completely surprised. Devastating attack on our Pacific fleet. But Yamamoto said something very prophetic. And I think it was because he had lived in the United States and he knew how Americans would really react. He said, we'll do the attack, but then you know we're, we're risking waking a sleeping giant. And we better seal our uh, security. We better win the war short, quickly, within six months. Or uh, they're going to turn it against us and we're going to lose this war. And that's actually what happened. For about six months after Pearl Harbor, the bad guys were on the advance, and particularly in the Pacific. And it took us that long, the Battle of Midway and so forth. We were able to start to turn the thing around. But Yamamoto was right. And no place contributed more in terms of war production or in terms of men and women going into the military than the city of Detroit. The sleeping giant was certainly awakened uh, on, um, on December 7th, 1941. You know, not everybody thought that the sleeping giant could wake up or that a nation that could produce so many consumer goods like automobiles, not everybody thought we could make bullets and planes and tank parts uh, and, and uh, airplane and fighter engines. They didn't think we could do that that quickly. 
I don't like to quote often Hermann Goering, the Reich Marshal of Hitler, a very arrogant fellow. He was asked in 1940, when he, they're fighting Great Britain, uh, Goering was asked, are you worried about the United States coming into the war against Germany? And he scoffed and said, Americans only know how to make refrigerators and razor blades. We're not concerned. Of course, we jammed that down his throat because scrap metal, a bunch of razor blades, I don't know how many will make a nice mortar or a, a, a cannon piece for artillery. Um, people were suspicious that the United States and Detroit leading the way, the most important industrial center really in the world, not everybody was sure we could, we could turn the thing around and do it nearly overnight, and we did. And uh, when I think about it, there are certain phrases that come to my mind when I think of Detroit during World War II, the people on the home front and the men in uniform and the women in uniform. There's a phrase that comes to my mind. Uh, it comes from the military, I think. Have you heard this? Can do. Can do. Edsel Ford, uh, his father uh, was a little bit reluctant about it, but you need us to build a bomber plant out near Willow Run Creek practically overnight and make these very complex bombers, the B-24. Um, we we'll, can do. We'll do it. And we did it. And it took a lot of organization, a lot of planning, and it's really stunning. Uh, by the way, Willow Run didn't take off immediately in its production. It took a while to get it going. How many of you know somebody who worked at Willow Run? I think I heard of Rosie the Riveter person. Um, the Yankee Air Museum has been very good about trying to preserve that story. Um, it took the, the aircraft people in California thought, oh, these Detroit people, they don't know how to make planes. They can make Oldsmobiles and Fords and stuff like that, but they can't make, they don't know how to make airplanes. Henry Ford went to the press, as he often liked to do, and said, not only are we going to build these B-24 bomber planes that are so desperately needed, we, we did a study, Edsel Ford, who's a hero of my book. Edsel, we went out and looked at the aircraft plants in California and Washington, Boeing, and so forth. They're making two, three, four planes a day. I think we're going to make, at Willow Run, we're going to make one B-24 bomber per hour. And I'm sure Edsel Ford was freaking out when his dad shot his mouth off to the press because this was an unbelievable uh, kind of speed. Um, and by the way, it didn't work immediately. It took almost a year to get the first plane off that giant twin assembly line out at Willow Run. And you know, those people out in California were laughing at us and saying, ah, see, we told you they couldn't do the planes. They started to call it, will it run? And you know how that made the old man angry. Well, by 1943, 1944, production cranked into full gear out at Willow Run. And uh, let's say by 1944, we were, uh, they were producing one new, brand new, ready to go. This is a shakedown run over the city of Detroit. One new bomber every 63 minutes, every 58 minutes, somewhere. It's close enough for me, just about one per hour. It's just incredible. The engineering feat that that involved, the labor, the training, everything that went into that. And Willow Run, I think, became an international symbol of can do. Uh, you want us to build, Chrysler, they're going to build a, a, a tank arsenal way out there, 10, 12 mile and mound. Yeah, that's a bunch of woods up there. That's a good place for hunting. It's not a place for a factory. You're going to make tanks, M3 tanks, and later the M4 Sherman tank. Yeah, we're going to do that, can do. And guess what? Out of that Warren tank arsenal in Macomb County, over 22,000 tanks were produced within a little over three years. It's staggering. We were making more tanks in a month than Germany could make in a year by 1944-45. We overwhelmed the bad guys with production. And Detroit led the way. I don't want to knock Pittsburgh and its steel mills and California. I did already knock the, the aircraft people out there. The heck with them. Uh, it's amazing that we were able to do that type of production. And also, you know, stamping plants were making combat helmets. Um, silk was being used to make parachutes. All of that was happening. Every business, every 
industrial enterprise in the, in the city of Detroit, the greater city of Detroit, was going full blast, sometimes doing three shifts. Unemployment disappeared. The, new, the, uh, the depression was over. This happened in a very, very fast fashion. And as a tribute to the can-do of Detroit in particular and the country, can I quote Joseph Stalin? And that's the last bad dictator I'll quote tonight. <laughs> Stalin met with Roosevelt and Churchill at these summit meetings. And they, their first one was in Tehran, in Iran. And on the last night of that meeting in 1943, uh, Stalin, who wasn't a tall guy, stood up, raised his glass, I presume it was vodka, and said, let's drink a toast to Detroit, the city that is winning this war. This is not a guy who handed out compliments very easily. So even Marshal Stalin, and boy, the Russians needed our deuce and a half trucks, they needed our tank parts, they needed our food, and it was not easy to get those things. To People also forget Stalin was our ally. Did you know that during World War II? The bad old dictator and mass murderer that he really was suddenly became good old Uncle Joe, you know, uh, sort of like a viper in your house. But we couldn't have won the war without the Russians, without the British. So amazing production. And I look at the workers who worked on, those, on the floor of those plants and the skills that they had, and they worked overtime, and they were happy to get paid, you know, and they had money to spend in Detroit, and there was a lot to spend it on during the Second World War. Their uh, contributions were nothing short of heroic. I guess what I would say about Detroit as a production center, as the arsenal of democracy, building munitions during World War II, Folks, you all know about it. It's bigger than you thought. It's just absolutely staggering, the speed of our conversion and the volume with which we were able to produce things. I think of the Rosie the Riveters. You know, 40% of the workforce out at Willow Run were women. And uh, they were welding. Wendy the Welder, Rosie the Riveter. Uh, they were having to figure out about child care. They were doing heavy jobs, and I think everybody felt involved in the war, probably on the home front, in a way that maybe we don't think about it today in our fighting forces abroad. Everybody knew somebody on their block who was off fighting, or somebody in their family, and um, everybody felt an obligation, and the Rosie the Riveters are a great story because they stepped up big time, can do. You need us to do these things? I'm a housewife. You want me to do welding? You're going to train me to do? Yes, can do. That's one phrase I like. Can I give you the other? If, if I could summarize in one word, and then we can go home. One word, Detroit, during Second World War. And how I feel about how we stepped up to do these things. There's one word. It's not used anymore. But I'd like to bring it back into circulation, if you will help me. When I think of Detroit, when I think of Rosie the Riveter, when I think of the people, all the people involved in planning and putting our production together, not only can do, but I, the, the one word that comes to mind, raise your hand if you know this word, we had moxie. Raise your hand if you are, how many, get them up way high, moxie. Moxie. It was a popular slang expression in the 1940s. Somebody told me it's actually named after a soft drink uh, with the chocolate and vitamins and it's supposed to make you strong. What is moxie? Anybody, who, somebody who raised their hand, shout out, what, what, do you, what does moxie mean? Somebody says you've got moxie, what does that mean? Chutzpah. Chutzpah. <laughs> I spoke at the Jewish Community Center last couple weeks ago and somebody yelled out, yelled out chutzpah. Um, anybody, any other word come to mind? That's a good one. Determination, you get knocked down, you dust yourself off, you get back up and you're stronger than ever. Americans, men and women, and even I would say children had moxie, not to mention our fighting forces. So one of the surprises in writing this book, Detroit in World War II, was just the scale. It's bigger than you think of our production during the war, and it's an amazing conversion. Connected to that first surprise was something, it almost makes me sad to talk about this when I think of World War II. In this country, after Pearl Harbor in particular, you might even not know this word. There was something going on in this country called teamwork. People were working together. They were dropping their differences with each other as Americans and joining together to do this job that had to be done. We had an existential threat to our country. 
Um, one of my favorite little anecdotes, um, Mr. Knudsen, who was the, uh, the uh, head of General Motors, the biggest corporation in the world, he was sitting in his office uh, in Detroit when France fell in 1940. And this is really some alarm bells were going off in Washington. We better get our act together because England's next and maybe then they're going to come across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, he got a phone call from the Oval Office in Washington, and I, I can almost picture this phone call. President Roosevelt, who say what you will about him, uh, and there are things that can be said about him, he had a knack for putting the right people in the right jobs. Uh, he called William Knudsen, who, and Knudsen had a Danish accent, he was an immigrant. He, I can picture the phone call, is Mr. Knudsen. We are in trouble. Our country is in trouble. Will you lead a crash program to organize munitions production? Knudsen was a uh, Republican. He didn't like the Roosevelts. He didn't like the New Deal. Um, he didn't have much use uh, for, um, he dropped, he, his, his response was, yes, sir, Mr. President, where do you need me and when? Uh, Knudsen was in Washington, D.C. within the week as the most famous and important probably of the dollar a year men, these captains of industry who donated their time and their organizing talents to putting this whole production machine together. And uh, I just think it's great. He, you know, Republicans and Democrats working together. Uh, can you believe it? As President Roosevelt might say, government, big business, and labor working together. Can you even imagine that today? Um, and we could not have done it without moxie, without can-do, without a lot of courage, a lot of hard work, sweat, blood, and teamwork, and bipartisanship. Maybe that'll come back. I personally feel if we ever had a situation where we were under that type of a threat, we would pull together. And I think we would get our act together, and Americans will always have that ability. But right now, we don't have a lot of commonality in the country sometimes. So the scale of the production, the inspiring level of teamwork that occurred during World War II in Detroit and in other industrial centers. You're from Flint? Yeah. Flint contributed too, okay? <laughs> Is that, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple more surprises. One not so pleasant was the divisions. There, even though we had teamwork, we had racial divisions in this part of the world. I tended to think it was in the South where Jim Crow segregation was so strong. But as I studied this situation, you know, we had a lot of white and black people pouring into Detroit from the South for jobs, and they were getting paid 10, 10 times as much as they could make down on the farm in Mississippi or in Tennessee or Kentucky. Um, whites and blacks jammed in, standing in lines together going to the park, going to Belle Isle to go swimming, uh, you know, fighting for recreational space, um, just a really crowded city. In close proximity, this was a kind of a recipe for an explosion, and that did happen. I'm sorry to say that in uh, June of 1943, Detroit had the worst race riot uh, in the country during World, World War II. There were other race riots. They tended to happen. Uh, in boom towns like uh, El Paso and Los Angeles, Mobile, Alabama, Detroit, 43 dead. Um, cars overturned, National Guard called in. In the middle of a war, we had martial law, we had curfews. It's a sad story. And a lot of it has to do, of course, with the segregation. A lot of, uh, we had a group of Tuskegee Airmen who were stationed briefly at Selfridge Field on their way to becoming the red-tailed Tuskegee pilots. And when they went off the base, they had to be very careful. They couldn't sit at a Cunningham drug counter in many places in metropolitan Detroit. They couldn't go to the officer's club. Uh, they, they couldn't uh, drink a beer or have a hamburger. They couldn't go to a swimming pool. They, there were bowling alleys for blacks, on, for Negroes only at certain nights in this part of the world, and so that's a pretty uh, chilling kind of thing. When you think about, I think this, I think World War II changed that. Because as we couldn't waste people, and people began to realize, you know, these, this segregation is foolish, wasteful, and uh, also not so attractive. We're fighting Hitler. 
who speaks about master race and that kind of, we got it here, we need to get past that. And so the contributions of the Tuskegee Airmen, the 761st Tank Battalion, the men and women, the Black Rosies who worked in the plants, um, really began to change the mood of the country, move us forward to what would begin to gel in the 50s, the civil rights movement to overturn Jim Crow segregation. But we had, a, I have to tell you, we had a terrible race riot right here in the city, and it was scary. Uh, Dr. Finken and Bynum and I teach together at Detroit Mercy, and we're both, we both came here in the 90s. And as I teach about history, I hear people, I hear people around here saying, oh yes, the Detroit riots, the Detroit riots. My usual response is, which one? Because, you know, you, people are usually talking about 1967, but there was one in 1943 in the middle of the war. There was one in 1863 during the Civil War. A lot of race riots, a lot of racial conflict in the country. So while there was unusual levels of teamwork, we had a lot of work to do in terms of uh, dropping Jim Crow segregation in the country. And then I think the other surprise, and this was a joyful surprise, was just how much the joint was jumping. And I'm talking about within the city limits of Detroit. Did you know there were over 100 movie theaters, including the Redford Theater, which kind of the last man standing, 100 movie, neighborhood movie theaters in the city of Detroit during World War II. The bills changed two, three times a week. Kids could go all day on a Saturday, uh, and people were really going to the movies at all-time high levels. And I'm, I got all, you're all West Siders, right? Do I have any East Siders in the room? I discovered there is a, you're an East Sider? Did you get your passport stamped to come over to the side of town? It took you an hour and a half to get here. Um, I hung out mostly with West Siders my first 10 years in Detroit, and I heard what a bunch of losers those East Siders are. They can't drive, and they drink too much, and they're no good. Then I started hanging around East Siders, and they said the same thing about you guys, the West Side. So there is really no difference. Um, but so most of you are West Siders. I want to ask you, those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, did you have a neighborhood movie theater that you went to? Why don't you raise your hand and, and tell me what was your neighborhood theater, let's say, during the, the, during the time when there were theaters? What was yours? Uh, we had two, the Vogue and the Alger. The Vogue and the Alger. Right. And where were they located? Uh, the Vogue was on Harper, and the Alger was on East Warren. Okay. Boy, you really are far west. How much? Twelve. Twelve cents, yes. I think they gave away dishes and stuff, too, back in those days. And you'd see a newsreel, you'd see cartoon, you'd see um, Bugs Bunny uh, kill, beating the Nazis, you'd see uh, maybe a Tarzan movie, and then you'd see maybe a Hope and Crosby movie, all kinds of stuff. Who else had a neighborhood theater? Raise your hand if you had one that you remember. You guys are all Redford Theater, right? Anybody else? Yeah, where? Redford? Well, Redford and uh, Northwest Urban. Northwest, where, where is that one? Okay, all right. Anybody else have, did you have a neighborhood theater in Flint? Yeah, the Gem Theater. What is it? G-E-M Theater. The Gem Theater in Flint, which I'm guessing doesn't exist anymore. It was a bowling alley, but it's closed. It was a bowling alley. Oh, people went bowling all the time, too. Lots of recreational activities. And you could get to them easily, by the way, because within the city of Detroit, the city limits, there was a streetcar line of more than 500 miles. Streetcars going up and down Woodward. We're trying to recreate that a little bit now. Uh, going up uh, Gr Gratiot, going up Michigan, uh, going up Livernois. They used to call the University of Detroit the streetcar university because people would hop on the street. Anybody know how much a streetcar ride cost? I'm told it was a nickel. And you pay an extra penny for a transfer. Is that right? OK. Uh, so you could, you could walk to your neighborhood theater. You could go to a bigger theater, maybe the Redford, a bigger neighborhood theater, more ornate. Or you could go downtown to Grand Circus Park, to the Michigan and the United Artists and the other big theaters down there, and of course the Fox. Uh, movie theaters everywhere. I discovered during World War II, Detroit even had a theater downtown dedicated just to newsreels. Can you imagine that? It was called Telenews. The building is still there on Lower Woodward near Grand Circus Park. And it had 24 hours a day, by the way. You get off your third shift, you can go 
watch films about Guadalcanal or Tobruk or Kasserine Pass or Saint Lo uh, or the Advance on the Rhine. You could watch war uh, newsreels. And they had a news ticker in the lobby and people would go and just be transfixed. And I'm told a lot of people would go see the newsreels at the Telenews looking for their brother, looking for their son. Is that my son there in the Philippines? Try to find out, you know, where they are. Newsreels, weeks after the event, my students don't understand this at all. They just can't relate to it. We have instantaneous communication. So there were, uh, there were news, there were movie theaters and there was even a theater that opened on Valentine's Day 1942 and uh, big production and all, it was all about newsreels. You could go dancing. People went dancing all the time. The dance ballrooms, the Vanity, Paradise, the Grandy Ballroom, yes. Um, and uh, I'm told they had built springs under the wooden floors of some of these big ballrooms. And, you know, people would go. I, I talked to a lady, uh, she's now in her late 80s. She says, I was 14 at the end of World War II. I used to go out dancing with my girlfriends all the time at the Vanity Ballroom. We had good, clean fun. We learned to dance, and we drank Verners. There was no alcohol at these places. So it's a big dance culture. My students are interested in swing music. Paradise Valley, uh, the, the clubs along there are gone. They're kind of under any Interstate 375. But there, was, there were a lot of saloons, a lot of bars, a lot of drinking, a lot of dancing, a lot of good times to be had. And the music of World War II, very big in Detroit. Can you, what are some songs you think of with World War II? Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree. Uh, I'll, we'll meet again. Some of them are sentimental. Some of them are kind of novelty songs. Can you think of other World War II songs? White Christmas. White Christmas, the best seller of all time. Bing Crosby, uh, Irving Berlin. Um, that's all, it's a song about separation. That was written really in the middle of the war, and that's why it became so, uh, so such a best seller. And in every bar you went to, and a lot of other places too, there were these things called juke boxes. Would you come and tell my students what a jukebox is? You could put, I think, a nickel in and you could hear music. And I got to tell you about this, these brothers. I think they were the Johnson brothers, two 19-year-old, 18-year-old kids to, who came up from Kentucky for war jobs. And they were very musical. They came up to Detroit and they were working in a plant on the east side. One day in early 42, I think it was, um, these two brothers from Kentucky went into a little teeny tiny recording studio called Universal Recording Studio on East Jefferson. And they'd written a kind of a novelty, funny song. There were a lot of novelty songs, Straighten Up and Fly Right, um, Pistol Packin' Mama. I love those, don't you? Um, Rosie the Riveter, of course. I find new novelty songs from World War II all the time. My latest one I found is Milkman, keep those bottles quiet. You know, the war workers are at home trying to sleep during the day. These guys got together, just as almost a joke, they recorded this little novelty number in Detroit called Hamtramck Mama. How many know Hamtramck Mama? I actually discovered you can hear the thing. You go to YouTube, you can listen to it. Adults only, very suggestive a little bit risque. There are no children I see in here. Uh, Hamtramck Mama, it's about a war worker, a woman of Rosie the Riveter, who works really hard at work, but really likes to play. And at night, she likes to shimmy. That's another word that's not used too much. This is about as specific as I'm gonna get. It's this fun, bouncy tune, and it's about a kind of risque, you know, war worker, female. Hamtramck Mama. Well, guess what? It took off. It was on every jukebox in town. It sold 300,000 copies in just a couple of months. They're, oh my gosh. Everybody loved Hamtramck Mama, except the mayor of Hamtramck, who went to the city council and got an ordinance passed banning the play of Hamtramck Mama within the city limits of Hamtramck. He said, my Polish Catholic constituency won't like that. When they banned it, it only made it more popular, right? 
So uh, Hamtramck Mama, go home and go home and listen to it, um, and it's on YouTube. And uh, they, they, by the way, they went back to the studio and went to the well again, and they recorded something called Highland Park Mama. It flopped. You know, you can't. They couldn't recreate the magic. And by that point, shellac was in short supply. They stopped making records like this, and uh, that was it. But that's the little story. I discovered things like Hamtramck Mama. Um, uh, let's see, um, sports during World War II. I talk about it. Uh, rationing during World War II. There was a great little uh, Walter Winchell. Walter Winchell, how many recognize that name? He had a regular column in the papers, and he also had a radio program. He wrote, my students are always interested to see what was in short supply and what was rationed, gasoline, things like that. Um, and victory gardens were going on crazy like that. Um, Walter Winchell had a little poem that he read on the radio. He said, in 1944, I think it was, he says, Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, remember? <laughs> so, you know, rationing was very much in play. And if you were out joyriding, is this trip necessary? You know, everybody, if you went to the butcher shop and tried to get more than your quota of meat, quota of meat you might hear a neighbor going, don't you know there's a war on? You're going to be in trouble among your neighbors. So there was a lot of pressure not to be wasteful, to be careful about what you did. And there was a lot of rationing going on. I discovered there was, we, we had victory beer in Detroit, brewed in Detroit. Who are my beer drinkers in the room? There was a, there was a brewery owned by the Coppets Company on Atwater, down, downtown. They produced something called V-Beer, Victory Beer, from Detroit. And the beer had, uh, I think, there were 100, 100 different labels, and it'd have a battleship or uh, a fighter plane or maybe a Jeep or some other piece of equipment being produced often in Detroit. And you could be patriotic when you go to the bar and drink beer. Of course, it was 3-2 beer, uh, just as you get at Tiger Stadium now. You could go get it at uh, Briggs Stadium, as it was called then. Sports during World War II, what can I say? They continued. President Roosevelt, as you know, from a league of their own or some other, you know, they continued major league sports and college sports during the war. President Roosevelt said, it's good for morale. Let's keep the games going. But I wouldn't say the best players were always on the field, say, at Briggs Stadium. You had a lot of too old, too young, not talented enough players on the field a lot of the time. But, you know, Major League Sports continued. Uh, the Red Wings won a Stanley Cup in 1943, beating the, uh, beating the Boston Bruins in a building that was known as the Old Red Brick Barn. How many of you have been in Olympia Stadium on Grand River? Ugh. Oh, I got to go one time. Last year, it was in, in operation. And I remember sitting in the balcony, and it was dark, and there was a cloud of smoke and it smelled like 60 years of cigar smoke and perspiration and beer. And I thought we were going to fall into the ice. And I loved it. It was fantastic. Kids today will never know what the uh, Olympia Stadium was like. But the Red Wings played, and they won, a, they won one of their cups. The Lions went 0-11 in 1943. <laughs> they played at Briggs Stadium. Um, but another interesting story, um, oh, Joe Lewis, of course, the Brown Bomber. You know, he was very patriotic. He gave up a very lucrative boxing career to go into the Army as a private. And he appeared on recruiting posters in African-American neighborhoods. He traveled around war zones. It's estimated that 5 million GIs or service people saw Joe Lewis fight uh, in war zones. And by the way, Joe insisted that the crowds that came to see him had to be integrated. So you can see these seeds being planted. And then you have the Detroit Tigers. They're, they didn't have very good years for most of World War II. Uh, but I, when, in writing this book, the hero of my book, I mean, there are a lot of people who were overlooked. I think Hank Greenberg, I have to say, is the biggest hero that I found. And that's, I wrote it that way. And a writer, when you're writing a book, you're always looking for a slam bang finish. Thank you, Hank Greenberg. You gave it to me. Do you know about Hank Greenberg? I thought I did. I've been out to Comerica Park. I've seen the statue, uh, you know, Hall of Fame career. 
he really was Detroit's answer to Babe Ruth. I mean, he's six foot four, a strapping guy, handsome guy, hit 58 home runs one year in the late 1930s. Good gosh, he was, everybody was, uh, all pitchers were afraid of him. Hank Greenberg. He's a hero to me for several reasons. One is which he was not embarrassed about who he was. He was the only openly Jewish ball player in the major leagues. Uh, who he wouldn't play on Rosh Hashanah and other high holidays. Uh, people knew that he was uh, a Jewish player. And Hank one time said, in an interview, he said, you know, when I go out on that field, especially on the road, I got to produce. If I go up there, and I got to go up there, and somebody's always hoping that I'll fail. And then they can call me an SOB and every other name in the book. And that did happen. And Hank used a phrase, that, this is in the late 1930s, Hank Greenberg, the great hero of the Detroit Tigers. Hitler's over here denouncing Jews, the, the Kristallnacht, bad things are happening. Here's Hank Greenberg doing his thing and a national hero, doing it right. He said, uh, he said this quote that I use as a chapter title, sometimes when I hit a home run, I feel like I'm hitting one against Hitler. This is in like 1939, he said. Hank went on to be in the uh, military for over four years after Pearl Harbor. He was gone for over four years as a battle captain in the China-India-Burma theater. Won four battle stars. He was in the service longer than any other major league ball player. So this is a, hero, this is a patriotic guy. And um, what I discovered is um, he came back in uh, 1945, like millions of other veterans, Hank Greenberg came back and he wanted his job back. He rejoined the Detroit Tigers, get this, the war in Europe is over, still not finished with Japan. July 4th, 1945, uh, over 50,000 people at Briggs Stadium, Hank Greenberg came to the plate, July 4th, hits a home run, first at bat. Can you imagine the roof blew off the place? He was back like a lot of other veterans. And he didn't really like to talk about his war record. He basically said, I've turned the page. I just want to start my life again, and I want my job. And he was doing a good job. He played well enough. He really wasn't the old Hank Greenberg by 1945, though. He was older. He was banged up. He was slower. The swing wasn't quite there. He played well enough July, August, into September. He played well enough. He was a contributing member of a team that actually was in contention. The Tigers had a good team uh, that year in 1945, and they're competing for the pennant. So I, sh I fast forward to the last game of the 1945 regular season baseball. The Detroit Tigers have a pennant hanging in the balance. If they can win, they're going to be in the World Series. Um, it was a rainy, cold day at um, Sportsman Park in St. Louis. The St. Louis Browns, they were out of contention. Not many people there. Some people thought we ought to just call the game. The weather's so bad today. They played it. Hank got thrown out early in the game. He had a bad ankle. He didn't look too great. Well, it came down to uh, the ninth inning, last game of the season. The bases get loaded for the Tigers. They're behind. And who comes up to bat? Oh, Hank Greenberg, the St. Louis Browns pitcher, I won't embarrass him by telling the name of the guy, said, let's pitch to Greenberg. He's old, he's washed up, it'll be an easy out. First pitch was a ball, Hank, second pitch, strike. Third pitch, Hank, Hank Lyons won just inside the foul pole in the outfield. Home run, grand slam, home run. Ninth inning, last game of the 1945 season. Hank Greenberg put the team on his back and took him into the World Series with that. That's a big finish. That's the finish of the book. Gives me chills even to talk about it. Uh, so this is a guy who delivered. And uh, the next time you look at that statue at Comerica Park, think about the, the courage and heroism that he had and the skills that he had. He later got traded to the uh, National League, I think, and with Pittsburgh, you know, it's a business. And uh, he got to meet Jackie Robinson, and he kind of advised him. He mentored him. Here's how you deal with the hecklers and the death threats and all the other things that Hank had a lot of experience with. You want to know how the series came out in 1945? I'm not sure I want to say. 
Hank hit another two home runs in the 1945 World Series, and the Tigers beat in seven games, they beat the Chicago Cubs, my team. That doesn't hurt so bad now that we've had the 2016 uh, champions. Um, let's go to some, I've talked a lot. Let's, I want to show you some, some slides, and you're going to, Carl's going to turn. The, this is just some pictures from the book that kind of go through um, what I've been talking about a little bit. This is a B-24 Liberator bomber, which is what Willow Run produced 8,668 of those babies in very short order. Flying over the city of Detroit, I really like that. I thought about using that as a cover image. But you can see, you can kind of see the Penobscot building and some other buildings there. Okay, let's go to the next one. I mentioned how so many people were against going to war uh, before Pearl Harbor. This is a picture from 1941 in downtown Detroit. Mothers of the U.S. Um, Michigan Division, they are saying, no more wars. Roosevelt, don't drag us into another war. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to you know, Roosevelt had a program to get aid to Britain and later to the Soviet Union called, imagine I have to tell my students, Lend-Lease. Let's get excited, students. Lend-Lease was patently illegal. I think Roosevelt just kind of made it up and said, well, we're going to, we're not going to sell uh, munitions and bullets and bombs to the British. That's illegal, but we'll lend them those implements of war. We're still waiting to get paid back. It was, but uh, these ladies, uh, they had a protest out on Belle Isle. They were very active. I understand why they didn't want to go to another war. They had a uh, poster that said, mothers will not lend or lease their sons. So I can't emphasize enough how much anti-war feeling there was. Right up isolationism, I guess you would say. And you had people like Detroit-born Charles Lindbergh going around the country. Even Henry Ford didn't want to go to war. Pearl Harbor changes that. Next, this is the um, next picture would be, um, this is Pearl Harbor. A friend of mine, Bob Rouse, battle captain, took this picture back in 2015 at the, how many of you have been to the Pearl Harbor Memorial in Hawaii? You've seen this wall of the dead. And if you look in the middle there, um, B.R. Marsh Jr., Ben Marsh was from Gross Point, Michigan. Michigan's first official casualty. Uh, he was one of the 2,405 who perished as a result of the attack at Pearl Harbor. And his parents, his family at Gross Point, they got a, you know, regret to inform telegram. And as I said, Yamamoto said, this is going to wake the sleeping giant. He, I think the Japanese thought we would turn tail and run or we'd be so divided or too soft. Next slide shows the real reaction. Of, this is a recruiting station down on Woodward. The, uh, the Army recruiting station at Fort Wayne and uh, on Fort Avenue. Um, is, that called, is it called Fort Avenue? The, the, the induction centers throughout the city and all across the country were jam-packed with people wanting to join the service after Pearl Harbor. This is in a week of Pearl Harbor, and you can see the women are, can, are ready to do that as well. That's right down on Lower Woodward. It actually had an incredibly unifying effect, an incredibly mobilizing effect. So we're ready to, we're ready to do what we have to do. We got Moxie. This was an interesting picture that I got from the Ruther archive. Some of these are from the Walter Ruther archive at Wayne State, our competitor. These are actually British children uh, living in Windsor uh, during World War II. And uh, you know that the British, many, if they had the money, they sent their children to Canada and to other places for safety. And you know, to the credit of the people of Windsor, and they also produced lots of implements of war from their auto plants and so forth. The people of Windsor welcomed these young British kids. They treated them like their own family. They got good education. They were well fed. But I look at that and I also see a little sadness in their eyes. They're like orphans. Because it's a reminder that back home, their families are at great risk. Hitler is just knocking at the door. So these are uh, British children, a kind of reminder of how bad the situation was across the Atlantic. British children in Windsor. Next one, uh, I'm kind of forgetting. The master architect, do you know who this person is of Detroit? I think he built everything. Albert Kahn. I mean, he designed the, the Packard plant, the Highland Park plant. He designed, Willow Run was his last design. 
and he did a good job. Um, the Warren Tank Arsenal, not to mention all the beautiful skyscrapers and buildings and homes. He, 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 he uh, designed a lot of the buildings that helped to defeat Hitler. In fact, Albert Kahn is globally known as Detroit's master architect. He was the son of a Jewish rabbi and their family had immigrated and I don't know a person in the world who did more to beat Hitler than Albert Kahn. So there's a kind of nice story there. There he is in his office in the Fisher Building, which he designed. Next, please. Here's one of his uh, designs. This is the Warren Tank Arsenal, uh, kind of operating at full scale as we move uh, into you know, 1943, 1944. Um, and you can just see, can you imagine the clatter, the noise as the, as the thing is built? It's, it's ready. It, the first tanks were going to come off the assembly. The early tanks, by the way, the American tanks kind of sucked. The M3 tank, it wasn't until really we had the M4 Sherman that we had a tank that could kind of deal with the Germans. Um, and and we, we were sending them to the Russians and so forth. That's a Warren tank arsenal. Next, please. Here's same, this is the floor of the Warren tank arsenal. I like this picture because it looks, this teamwork, right? A tank is a very complicated thing to build. And I don't know if you've seen the Diego Rivera mural uh, in, at the DIA. It almost reminds me of one of the images, the guys working together almost as one to build these tanks. And you can see the patriotism going on. And they're getting, they're getting a nice paycheck also, which is not bad. Next, please. This is the first tank to come out of the Warren tank arsenal. It took a long time to get going. This is April 22nd, I think, 1941. We're not even in the war yet. We're getting ready. That is an M3 tank making a telephone pole into toothpicks as a kind of demonstration of its power. And you can see the, the, the employees got the day off to watch it do its run through its paces. The governor of Michigan was there. There was all kinds of brass from Washington. Uh, it was broadcast live on WJR, the great sound of the Great Lakes. Isn't that what they call it, the 50,000 watts? Yeah. Uh, so, um, the M3 tank, and this was a sign that we were beginning to get mobilized. Um, next, please. Ah, the president. The day Franklin and Eleanor came to Detroit, September 18th, 1942. This is a picture taken at the train platform at the Warren Tank Arsenal. It, by the fall of 1942, the president decided, you know, we've got, uh, we have uh, production going on in the country. I would like to do an inspection of the war plants. And the first place I want to go is Detroit. I want to see what's going on there. And so they did this trip. It wasn't easy to move Franklin around, you know. He had a special train. He had to be carried. You can see he's standing there kind of braced uh, against uh, standing, there, you know, appearing to stand on his own. Um, he went to Detroit and his first stop was the Warren Tank Arsenal. And by the way, Eleanor came along for this trip, which wasn't the usual situation by that point. But just imagine you're working on the tanks and you look up on the train platform in the plant. And isn't that Franklin Roosevelt up there? It was a surprise. Nobody knew it was going to happen. Top secret. Here's Franklin Roosevelt at the Warren Tank Arsenal making an inspection tour of Detroit's, one of its biggest war plants. Next, please. Here is uh, Franklin and Eleanor in their Sunshine Special convertible limousine. That's Mr. Keller, of the CEO of Chrysler, explaining to them the tank assembly process for the M3 tanks. And uh, they're listening intently. Next, please. Ah, uh, then they said, you know, we got a new tank, the M4 Sherman. It's going to be even, it's going to be so much better than this one. Let's go out to the track, the oval track, and watch it in, in its uh, performance. And you can see what the new tank's going to be like. You can see Franklin and Eleanor and the people in the car, and they're watching the, a bunch of Sherman tanks out kicking up mud, going through ditches, stopping and starting. It's quite a commotion out there. They're enjoying watching the demonstration of the new tank. Can you go back for one second? Um, and um, one of the tanks as the demonstration's about over, one of the tanks came barreling right at the presidential car. 
and it stopped, you know, dust was flying, mud was flying. Uh, it stopped either inches or maybe a couple of feet from the presidential car. And this was somebody's idea. They hadn't checked with the boss. We're going to test the braking system. We'll show them how the braking system works. The Secret Service was not amused. Uh, everybody was freaked out. Uh, President Roosevelt was a cool customer. He, he just, he laughed at all. <laughs> a good drive, my man, a good drive. But I've often wondered in my own mind, how would history have changed if Franklin Roosevelt had been flattened in Warren, Michigan on September 18, 1942? Somebody probably lost their job <laughs> over that one. Next, please. And then later that day, Franklin and Eleanor, of course, go out to Willow Run to check Henry Ford's plant. And you can see Edsel Ford, who's really the hero. He died in 1943. I think he worked himself to death. It was not easy to be Henry Ford's only child. Uh, and then you can see Henry uh, there as President Roosevelt is, is uh, standing or seated up in his uh, limousine. He's kind of waving and glad-handing and being the good, happy politician trying to raise morale. And the way I describe this picture, which the people at Yankee Air Museum gave me, I call this Henry Ford forces a smile, because he really hated the Roosevelts. And Edsel later said, here the president and the first lady come for this surprise. They're at the plant. They're at Willow Run. Where is Henry? They had to send out search parties to try to find Henry Ford. He was over in the most remote part of the building, working on some little technical thing. They back, basically had to drag him to meet the president and the first lady and shake hands. And you can see he's kind of smiling there. Edsel also said, then we made him sit between Franklin and Eleanor in the back of the car. And they were pretty tall people, and, and Dad just kind of sank between them and scowled the whole time. And they're driving around, and hey, Franklin, the Union people love him, cheering, clapping for the president and the first lady. Henry, uh, Edsel said, Our, my dad just scowled at us, me and Charles Sorensen, and the engineer, scowled at us the whole trip. But that's the famous visit of the president and first lady to visit the Detroit war plants. Next, please. This is Willow Run at full operation. Uh, words fail to, you know, um, Charles Lindbergh, who later became a, a consultant at Willow Run, helping pilots uh, with the planes. Uh, he couldn't believe what he saw when he saw the scale of this twin mile long assembly line, L-shaped, by the way. Henry insisted on that because he didn't want part of the building. It was built out near Belleville, near Ypsilanti. Somebody made a mistake. The surveyor made a mistake, and a little part of the factory was going to creep into Wayne County, you know, home of Democrats and unions and high taxes. Henry said, we ain't going to put the building in Wayne County, so they had to make it an L shape which was a challenge for Charles Sorensen, who created the Model T, but he did it. And the, that's, the, uh, that's one part of the building where men and women, Rosie the Riveter's working. Next, please. Here's a Rosie at Willow Run, uh, working on a plexiglass uh, window on one of the bombers. Next, please. This, to me, is a kind of posed glamour shot of a Rosie the Riveter um, at the run, as it was called. And, uh, you know, she looks pretty elegant, uh, frankly, but um, I went out when they broke the world's record for women dressed like Rosie. Have you heard about that a couple of years ago? Oh, it was fantastic. Little tiny girl babies wearing uh, red bandanas and work shoes. And the, the, there are Rosies still around. They were in wheelchairs. They were kind of moving a little bit slow. Those women in their 90s, they're still ready to do it. They're, they're ready to go to work today if we need them. They got moxie. Next, please. Crowded conditions. There was insufficient housing in Detroit. This is actually out near Willow Run, where there had been very little preparation for the, I think Willow Run at its peak had 42,000 employees, like a city, had its own hospital and all these things. This, my friends, is a duplex. This is a two-family unit, so you have a little privacy. And I don't know about the heating system or the plumbing, but you know how people did it? They worked together. And they made do, and they, they got through it. And so they were happy, and they were getting good wages, and they were being contributing to the war effort. Crowded conditions. Next, please. Here's a picture of the cramped conditions. Wheat. Wheat Krispies. 
This is not an unusual picture from World War II. Uh, space was at a great premium. And uh, this is kind of typical, a very tight housing market during World War II in Detroit. Next, please. Streetcars. This is the Grand River stop downtown. Kind of makes me nostalgic to look at. People well-dressed. And uh, as I say, over 500 miles of streetcar. In the, the last streetcar stopped in 1956. And I think somebody told me the cars were sold to Mexico City or something like that. It's kind of a shame. Next, please. This, you know, women were used not only for welding and factory jobs and rosy jobs, and they, worked, they were in the service, and they were nurses. Women's were women were driving cabs. They were pumping gas. They were plumbers. They were doing all kinds of jobs that they had previously been considered too weak to do or not, they weren't smart enough to do them. This is on the streetcar. This is Detroit's first conductor at a woman running a streetcar, Marguerite uh, Wilson, I think is her name. And I think what Kinzel's is a, what's Kinzel's? Drugstore. Drugstore, yeah. She's on her way home from work, but that's Detroit's first conductor at women doing all kinds of new jobs and doing them well. Next, please. Had to have something for the UAW. Uh, this would be a poster you might see in the factory. No absenteeism. Uh, keep your mouth shut. Loose lips sink ships. Hitler smiles when you waste miles. I just had to have a picture of, uh, of uh, Uncle Sam clobbering Hitler. And uh, the, the posters are quite beautiful from that time period. Next, please. OK, Pearl Harbor. This is the night of December 7th, Sunday night, at the Detroit-Windsor Tunnel. You know, they immediately uh, had blackouts. They started to have civil defense drills, and that night they started stationing machine guns outside uh, war plants, government buildings that border with Canada. These guys are at the Windsor Detroit Tunnel setting up a machine gun emplacement. Also, WJR and some of the radio stations. We were on high alert. We didn't know what the heck was coming next. As I look at these guys, they don't quite look like they know what they're doing, but they are mobilizing in case Canada Somebody gets across the border. Um, that's the border the night of uh, December 7th. Next, please. This is a street level shop window, of course, at JL Hudson's. And instead of the latest, you know, material was in short supply, uh, instead of the latest big fashions, there's a lot of patriotic stuff going on. You're darn right. Dar Detroit provides the tools for victory. There are pictures of MacArthur and Eisenhower and President Roosevelt and pictures of the Constitution. Patriotism was around everywhere you looked, and I think even children fed into that. That's, that's a Hudson's window. Next, please. Uh, they had a big flag. Maybe some of you are, That is a big, that's, is that bigger than the, than the Redford Theater flag? We got a big flag there, too. Next, please. Ah, one of my favorite pictures, the Kenwood Bar, kind of a saloon on the east side of Detroit. What's happening here is there is a fedora. See those hats? Every neighborhood guy who was in the service, they put a hat up above the bar with his name. And so when you went in there to have your shell and your shot after your shift or whatever, you looked up there and you thought about the people in your neighborhood. You thought about the guys in the service at all times. So, you know, you drink your victory beer and you're thinking of the guys. Kenwood Bar, great, great picture. Next. This is a civil defense drill. School children were on high alert. They were watching. They, could, they had little cards of the different German planes and the Japanese planes, and they were, you know, they were forward observers. Um, this is actually an integrated school in the city of Detroit. Typical, they were doing civil defense drills all the time. Next. This is the Telenews Theater, uh, which is on Woodward. Latest war news. Um, you could find out how the progress of the war is going. It's a beautiful kind of art deco facade. You all know this. It's now a nightclub <laughs> called Bleu. Bleu, something like that. But it opened on uh, Valentine's Day. Tyrone Power came to open the place. And it was 24 hours of newsreels, mostly war footage. Next, please. There were other ones in other cities. It was part of a chain. This, I think, is a, I can't remember. Is this a, this a Warhawk fighter plane flying again over Detroit? 
you know, war planes, fighter planes roaring across the sky, very common during the war. Detroit was really uh, on military high alert. You can kind of see the Detroit River over here. That's a P-40 Warhawk, I think it is, over Detroit. And you can see the buildings. Next, please. Ah, the subject of my next book. There were prisoners of war brought to the United States, Germans and Italians, almost half a million and 6,000 in Michigan alone. I discovered down at Fort Wayne, you know, by the river, which was a huge supply depot, was an induction and training center. We had Italian prisoners of war held at Fort Wayne. And those guys were so happy. You know, they, they had surrendered in the de desert in North Africa, you know. And we shipped them across on Liberty boats and they were scattered around the country and they did, they worked on road building projects and municipal buildings. Some of them worked in agriculture. This is the barber shop at Fort Wayne in Detroit. And I, I love the Italians. It's a little bit of a stereotyped picture, this posed picture. The happy Italian with the guitar and the fiddle. And that's the barber shop at Fort Wayne. And a lot of those guys, and the Germans too, who were scattered around the state, a lot of those POWs who were in Michigan, you have to buy my next book um, coming out in the fall, same press, history press. They said, you got any more good ideas? I said, hey, I got, nobody knows about the POWs. A lot of them came back and became American citizens after the war. Next, please. These are members of the 332nd uh, Air Wing at Selfridge Field. They gave me this photograph. They're in the classroom, and you can kind of see they're anxious to get their wings and get out there and start shooting German planes, which they did with great effectiveness starting in the Italian campaign. So that's at Selfridge Field. Next, please. The race riot, unfortunately, Black Monday. I think the, the problem, Detroit was, it was hot weather. They were, people were out crammed on Belle Isle on a hot June day, and fist fights began to start as people are clogged on the Belle Isle Bridge, which had just been renamed the MacArthur Bridge. And the thing, rumors started to spread, and the thing just got out of control. And for several days, Detroit was in a state of anarchy. This is not 1967, this is 1943. That's along Woodward, and you can see random destruction. 43 were killed. The final count was 43, I think. Here's some National Guard that were drawn into the city, and they're reading the paper. Um, and the sentencing of rioting. It's a pretty sad thing to happen in the middle of World War II when we're preaching equality, we're fighting for human rights, and we're trying to have teamwork. Next, please. You remember how I fought for this cartoon that I found, a political cartoon from the time. The Nazis, and also, this is Joseph Goebbels, this rat-like figure over here, and there's Hitler pinning a badge on this thuggish Jim Crow guy who's left a trail of broken bodies on the ground. The race riots were used as propaganda by the Nazis and also by the Japanese to show what a bad country we are and how hypocritical we were. And you can see the riot. Detroit had the worst, but we have Mobile, Alabama, El Paso, Newark, Los Angeles, some of the boom towns. There were these this wave of race riots that happened because of Jim Crow segregation and also um, close proximity uh, in, in the boom towns. Next, please. Here's your victory beer. Please like this picture. How about a round of applause for the picture? It cost me $200. I had to have a picture in, col in color of the victory beer from Coppets Brewery. There's a Jeep car. Uh, they, as I say, there were about 100 different labels. Even drinking beer is a patriotic act. 3-2 three, three, beer. Next, please. Here are the two kingpins of Detroit sports. This is out at Briggs Stadium. That's Hank. They're having a light moment with Joe. Is Joe wearing a zoot suit? I don't think that's a zoot suit. I think that's just a nicely tailored suit there. But those are the two iconic figures of Detroit sports at the time. Next, please. Oh, and the end of the war. Here's an ad from, I think, the Detroit News. Uh, an ad for Telenews. You can go down and see the latest reports from... Uh, Nagasaki smashed to dust, Hiroshima destroyed, bombed and atomized. This is August of 1945, just days before the final end of the war. Um, and the Palestine problem, still here, some things never change. But that's an ad for Telenews. Uh, as we're approaching 
victory over Japan Day, August 15, 1945, which I am told was the biggest party Detroit has ever had. The announcement of Japan's surrender, bigger than Red Wings, bigger than uh, Tigers. Go to the next page. Here's a picture around uh, downtown, around uh, Cadillac Square, I believe it is. VJ Day. Finally, the war is completely over. We're victorious, and we're kind of taking a victory lap. Children are staying up late. People are drinking, partying. Here's a guy down on a car. I don't know what he thinks he's doing. But it was a wild party for several days, actually. Next picture. Oh, here's a very happy serviceman that night. Um, he's got four babes on his arm as they're walking around uh, the streets of Detroit, reveling probably 2 in the morning. Patriotic, you know. Next, please. Detroit has always had a Chinatown. And people forget, uh, in, in Chinatown, they were celebrating the defeat of Japan. They had their own celebration with their own uh, rituals. They were happy as heck to be celebrating the defeat of the country that had so brutalized them. So that's Detroit's Chinatown on the night of VJ Day. Next, please. On a more somber note, the day after VJ Day, this is a picture from our own institution. This is the clock tower at the University of Detroit. And on the day after VJ Day, that clock tower, the bell chimed 137 times for the U of D men who would not be coming back to classes in the fall. So kind of a nice uh, memorial, very somber to go with all the partying and celebration. That's the U of D clock tower. Uh, next, please. Um, I took some pictures. I am now a published photographer. I went around the city and found, found things that people don't really notice. This is over by south of the Redford Theater at Losher and Outer Drive. There is a World War II memorial dedicated by the Brightmoor neighborhood in 1942. And you can see the, the services are represented there. And I drove by it on a summer day and took a picture in 2015. It's OK. The grass maybe could be cut a little better. Uh, the flag is flying. It looks good. But what I say is people speed by that sucker every day and don't even look at it. So what I would like is people to be aware of these things, these memorials and these monuments that can remind us of the sacrifice and the things that came before. That's it, Lasher. Next time you drive by there, you notice that. Next, please. Um, the Rat Skeller. Who's been to this place uh, down on John R. <laughs> since 1933? They're still going strong and very patriotic. Um, although, you know, they had a little problem before World War II. You, you, have you been to their Friday night sing-alongs? Uh, they have all these, somebody playing the piano. Their big song was Deutschland über alles. And then, they, then the war started. Maybe we better shelve that song. And so they started singing God Bless America as the big song. By the way, trivia question, raise your hand. Who is the person who made God Bless America so popular? Kate Smith. OK, yeah, all right, yes. The songbird of the South, Kate Smith. So the Raskeller, you can still down, go down there and get a nice Wiener schnitzel. Am I right about that? <laughs> Potato pancakes. I'll have one, please. Yeah. We, we, we took a young guy. He didn't know squat about German food. And he says, could I have one potato pancake? And we just heckled him for the rest of the meal. Yeah, you got like, three of them, big ones. Next, please. Uh, Paradise Valley, I mentioned, Hastings Street, unfortunately. You know, Duke Ellington, Dinah Washington, the ink spots. Lots of clubs, lots of gambling, lots of illicit activity, lots of fun and vitality. Um, and the Gotham Hotel and all that kind of thing. It's now, unfortunately, under the freeway at Interstate 375. They got a, a, a little historical plaque for it. Next. The Bluebird Inn. It's seen better days. This is over on Tireman on the west side. I got out of my car, took a picture real fast, and then left. Um, <laughs> this was a hopping jazz club. We still have Baker's Keyboard Lounge up by 8 Mile in um, Livernoy. But this was one of the most popular um, jazz clubs, a more intimate setting where you could hear music and dance and jitterbug and do all those things. Still there. Next, please. Anybody recognize this on East Jefferson? This is the Vanity Ballroom, and it's Art Deco, Aztec Deco. Again, it's seen better days. Maybe, I don't know, maybe Quicken Loans will buy it and turn it into, I don't know what, but 
The building still stands. Next, please. Here you go. This is for you guys. I had to have a picture of my Redford Theater. Um, and you know, if you, so most of you have been to the Redford Theater, you notice the decor, Art Deco decor from the late 20s, is a Japanese kabuki theater. Well, several days after Pearl Harbor, all that was painted over. <laughs> And it's only been in recent years they've been able to kind of restore it. And it looks beautiful now. Please go to the Redford Theater. Um, this was one of the most popular theaters, certainly on the west side. I had a little problem as a photographer because the marquee that week said, coming soon, uh, Jurassic Park. So I thought, OK, I'll just take a picture of the actual marquee. So how about a round of applause for me doing that? OK, next, please. Anybody recognize this at 12 and Mound, the victory? In I know I've seen you there, yeah. Um, founded by the Delama Lure family, Hall of Fame football player, their son. It opened in 1946, Italian American family near the uh, Warren Tank Arsenal. And why did they call it the Victory Inn? Because we, we won, and we still felt very good about it. So see, there are images. You know this, but a lot of people don't pay attention to all these signs of what came before all around us. Next. Oh, I like this one. This is downtown Ypsilanti, near the Willow Run plant. And that is the B24's espresso bar. And I went in there. I had to take a picture. And I went in, and there are all these like Eastern Michigan students. And, uh, history, and they're all on their tablets, and they're all on their devices. And they're drinking their espresso. They probably don't know what a B24 is. But uh, you know now they know. Uh, it's a great place. And tell them I sent you, and they'll give you a 10% discount. Downtown Ipsy. Next, please. The wonderful Yankee Air Museum, who have done so much toward uh, historic preservation. Save the bomber plant. And believe me, my students know this image. This one still lives. We can do it. Next, please. And I think we're at the, this is probably my last one. Th this is the Broadhead Naval Armory, which is now closed down on East Jefferson. And I had to have a finish for it, so honor piece, you know, that's a nice way to finish it. I think what, what I'd like to say is I want you to use the word moxie five times in the next week. And it will get back in circulation, and eventually I'll be hearing it. And um, give yourselves a hand for being here. And I'll be over here. I have copies of my book. If you'd like a signed copy, they're 20 bucks a throw. I love the Livonia Library, and I would like to come back, Carl, just saying. You guys are fantastic, and give yourselves a hand. And we need to get the word out about how important history is.